Hey guys, Matt here. Welcome to Learn to Discern. Well, we have someone new for you today as we are going to be assessing some of the teachings of Ben Lim. As always, we are simply going to listen to what he is teaching and we are going to compare it to the Word of God. But first, if you'd like to help promote Christian content here on YouTube, please go ahead and take a second now to subscribe to my channel and thank you in advance. All right, guys, here we go. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Ben Lim here, and I believe God is releasing reversals and returns. That's right, reversals and returns. The Bible says that he is the reverser of the curse. There is such a thing as curses and blessings. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Okay, so we need to go ahead and stop right here because he's bringing up Deuteronomy chapter 28, which has to do with blessings and curses. But if you notice the headings here, it's blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. So first off, Deuteronomy chapter 28 is a part of the Mosaic Covenant. So this was the covenant that was given to the Old Testament nation of Israel. So if we even start reading chapter 28, we start in verse 1. And if you, speaking to the nation of Israel, faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, that's very important, all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. That's why it can say he will set you high above the nations of the earth, because he's speaking to a nation. He's talking to the people of Israel. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city. And it goes on a lot of blessings from there. You can read it. We go down uh, starting in verse 15. And now it's the curses for disobedience. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes. This was for the Old Testament nation of Israel. It's saying, if you obey, then here are the blessings that will come. And if you don't, here are the curses that will come. And if you pay attention, you read through the remainder of the Old Testament, you see that a lot of times they are operating in the curses because they do not obey God's commandments. Now, are we under the Old Covenant law? Are we a part of the Old Testament nation of Israel? No, we are not. So these blessings and curses that he's talking about, they, they don't even apply to us as new covenant believers. But let's let him continue with his teaching. There's a list of curses and there's also a list of blessings. I don't know about you, but I want to live on a side of blessings, not curses. We know that. Okay, well, then you better obey every single thing that God has commanded under the old covenant in the Mosaic law. And considering the Bible says that all of us are uh, in sin, then you have not obeyed that and you should be prepared for curses. We are living in a fallen earth. However, it's our job to bring heaven on earth. The Bible you have a Bible verse for that? And if you're going to go to the Lord's prayer and say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that is us praying it. That is not an assignment that we are given to bring heaven to earth. There, there's no biblical support for that. The Bible here says in Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everybody who is hung on a tree. The Bible says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law because he became a curse. That's called a divine reversal, you know. Okay, so let's talk about what this means because contextually you hear him talking about Deuteronomy 28 and you have the list of blessings and you have the list, uh, the, the list of curses and he's like, well, Christ came to redeem us from the curse of the law. So now we just live under the blessings. Friends, again, Deuteronomy 28 is for the Old Testament nation of Israel. But now let's go to Galatians 3 and see what this is really talking about because it's not talking about what Ben is saying. So notice the header, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay, verse 10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. So it's one curse and it is for people who rely on works of the law, speaking about for salvation. If you think you are justified because of your behavior, you are under a curse. So that is the curse. The curse is that you would think that you can be made right with God through keeping his commandments. We know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So everybody would be under that curse if you're attempting to be justified by it. So it says, for it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. 
Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So this curse of the law, we know it is not referring to Deuteronomy 28 because that would be the curses of the law. This is speaking about one curse. What is the curse? The curse is, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. So the curse of the law is that you are not going to be able to be justified by the law. But Christ redeemed us from that by becoming the curse, for, by, by dying on the cross for our sins. In verse 14, for what reason? So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. I've actually heard people teach that Deuteronomy chapter 28 is the blessing of Abraham. Friends, Deuteronomy 28 is the Mosaic law. This is not, Abraham has been dead for over 400 years when this has been written. This is not the blessing of Abraham. I have heard people teach that before. The blessing of Abraham is that we would receive the promised spirit through faith. The blessing of Abraham is that you are saved by grace through faith. Just as in Genesis chapter 15, it says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. It was credited to it credited to him as righteousness apart from his own works. He simply believed. That is the blessing that is being talked about here. And so Ben Lim is making it seem like Christ came so that you don't have to live under the curses of Deuteronomy 28. Nope, it's just blessings all the time. And that is not what this passage of scripture is talking about at all. But we will let him continue. When somebody's trying to shoot you, as they point their guns towards you, the guns reverse and point to themselves. That's called a reversal. That's called a boomerang in the spirit. God so, I mean, has that been your experience? I want to go ahead and point out here that he, he made this two years ago. Let's see what date. February 24th, 2021. And he says this is the, the word that the divine reversals and returns are coming. So he says, you know, when somebody tries to do something bad to you, it's going to spin back around on them. Would you say that over the last two years, anytime anybody has tried to do something negative to you, it always just flipped right back around on them? I'm going to venture to say no. You've probably had some people do some pretty bad stuff to you, and that's because we do live in a fallen world, and it doesn't always go the way we want it to go. God is boomeranging every attack, and God is boomeranging everything that is wickedly done in the name of heathens. Things are being boomeranged back on their own head. Of course... We are getting ready to celebrate Purim. And Purim stands for the reverse of the curse. It stands for reversing the decree. Haman. Actually, the word Purim, if you look it up, it is the word that has to do with casting the lots. And uh, so it, basically Purim would have to do with the idea that God is sovereign because every decision comes from him. When the, when the lots were cast, basically kind of like rolling the dice, every decision was coming from God. So the book of Esther, which he's about to talk about in a second, is all about God's sovereignty and him providentially guiding every single event. It is not about Purim doesn't have to do with divine reversals. It is about the sovereignty of God. Tried to incite the king and said, these Jewish people, they're evil. We need to destroy them. So what did the king do? He spoke the word, the decree, and the people wrote it into legislation, and they passed it out all throughout the kingdom. As it was passed out, that was a decree or the law of the land. Of course, Esther and Mordecai heard about it. They fasted, sought the Lord, and they got the divine blueprints and strategies to reverse it. Eventually, they won the case in the courts of heaven and in the court of the king, gained favor. Okay, so one of the elders at my church and myself just recently taught through the entire book of Esther for Sunday school. And I can most definitively assure you that if you go back and read the entirety of the book, you will not see any mention in the book of Esther about Mordecai and Esther. It will talk about them fasting, but he said that they sought God until they got the divine blueprints or strategies. I forget how he worded it, but that was the basic idea that God gave them some strategy for what they were supposed to do. You will find no mention of that. 
nor will you find any mention of them winning the case in the courts of heaven. Ben Lin is just saying this as though it is an accepted fact. Everybody knows that they won the uh, the court case in the uh, in the court of heaven. It's like, no, the scripture doesn't say anything about that. You are just making this up. This is all nonsense. This is all your own ideas that you are inserting into the text. The Bible does not say any of this stuff. By the king. And now the allotment was reversed. The curse was reversed. The very person who sowed strife bore the fruit of it. The very person who sowed antagonization bore the fruit of it. That's called a return. That's called Okay, guys, this is a good time to talk about a, a principle that will help you when you read the Bible. So there are prescriptive and descriptive passages of Scripture. So in the story he's talking about in Esther, yes, you do have Haman trying to bring this wicked plot against the Jewish people. And ultimately, I guess you could say things do flip around on him in, in a sense, and he is he is ultimately hanged uh, for his behavior. And so God does uh, take vengeance out upon him. But is that story meant to be prescriptive, meaning that anytime anybody tries to do anything in your life, it's going to automatically flip around on them and it's going to work out in the here and now in some way that you would want it to have worked out. The answer is no. It is describing what took place then, but it is not a prescription for what is always going to take place. And we can think about numerous stories in scripture. I think about Stephen. I mean, Stephen preached a sermon in the book of Acts and the people wanted to stone him. Was there some divine reversal and all of a sudden those people were stoned? Nope. They killed Stephen. That's how it worked out. And guess what? It still worked out okay for Stephen because he got to go be with his Savior forever. The apostles, by and large, were martyred for their faith. There was not always the divine reversal. So he's making it seem like you can take that story and just say this applies to all people for all time in every circumstance. And we see scripturally that that is not the case because I could say, um, you know, if, if I wanted to use basically his technique, which is just to take a story and make it prescriptive, I could go to Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. And I'd say, listen, if you tell a lie, God is automatically going to strike you and your spouse dead because that's what happened in that story. That is not prescriptive. I have told lies, you have told lies, and if you're watching this, we're still living right now. So that is not a prescription for what is going to take place. This is a poor way to look at scripture. Called a boomerang. Are you ready to return back to sender? When somebody is trying to send you some hate mail, you send it back to the sender. Somebody's trying to send you some uh, evil messages and the mailman is trying to open up your door and leave it in the box and knock, knock who's there. You send it back to sender. You don't accept it. You don't tolerate it. And you revoke it and you return it back to the pit of hell where it came from. In the season of Purim, there's going to be reverses. I said reverses. What was meant for you is going to go back to your enemies. What the enemy intended to kill and to harm you, God will use it for his good. The devil tried to kill you, but it's becoming a setup and a platform for your future and your destiny. I now, I want to point out, you know, when he said uh, what the enemy means for harm, God's going to use for good. That is a biblical statement, but his his understanding of what that means is totally flawed because biblically speaking, when I say, you know, like Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Yes. Amen. I believe that verse, but does that mean that everything works out exactly the way that I want it to? No, but see, he's already, he's already talked about, you know, somebody's trying to do something to you. It's going to flip back around on, on them. So what he is saying when he says that whatever they mean for bad, it's going to turn around for good. He means that the actual situation is going to turn around. Like the bad thing is not going to come against you. Whereas we see very clearly from scripture. And in fact, we can look at just one verse that suffering is something that God uses in our lives to grow us. Certainly, I am not saying that God doesn't do miracles and won't deliver us from suffering at, at, at certain times, but we see very clearly in Scripture that trials and sufferings even have been ordained by God to grow us. And lest you think that I'm just making this up, let's read this passage of Scripture. This is 1 Peter chapter 4. The heading is Suffering as a Christian. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. 
Does it sound like Ben Lim is saying the same thing as 1 Peter chapter 4, where it says, listen, you're going through fiery trials, you're suffering. You can still rejoice in that because you are sharing in Christ's sufferings. Christ also suffered. And we know from scripture that it is meant to grow you and mature you in your faith to sanctify you and make you more like Christ. Verse 14. If you were insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as, as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what, be, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Now pay attention to verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Sometimes you suffer according to God's will. And it says, when you do, entrust yourself to your faithful creator and continue to do good, continue to be faithful and obey him in the meantime. This is the consistent message of scripture. Sometimes bad things happen to you. Sometimes you suffer. God is working through all of those things to conform you into the image of his son if you are ultimately trusting in Christ. This is not what Ben Lim is saying. Ben is saying... You know, somebody's trying to bring suffering to you, but God's going to flip it back around before you can get there. He's going to, boom, it's a special season and God gave me this prophetic word. It's not even going to get to you. They're going to suffer now. That is not what scripture says. I believe in this season, in this time of Purim, which means allotment. There's going to be reverses and there's going to be returns. That's right, returns. Every single thing that belongs to you will be returned to you. Your health, your family, the prodigals, the prodigals are returning. Every single thing that belongs to you will be returned to you with no delay. All right, let's end it right there. So he just said, right now, in that season, again, this is recorded over two years ago, almost, almost three years ago now. He said there was going to be no delay. Everything was going to get returned to you. If you had children who were not walking with the Lord, they were going to come to the Lord right away. If you were having health problems, boom, no more health problems right away. No delay, he said. You think that happened with all the people who watched this message? If you follow Ben Lim, has that been your life experience from this time forward? Nothing bad has happened. If you have people that you love in your life that don't know Christ, did they all immediately come to Christ? Did everybody receive their healing right away? No. But do you know why people listen to this? Because this sounds a lot better to people than something like 1 Peter 4, which is actually God's word, where it says, hey, you might suffer in it and it's God's will. And he's going to work in that. People would rather hear, I'm not going to have to suffer. Everything's going to work out. God's going to turn all of these things around. But friends, this is just um, itching ears. That's what he's doing. He is tickling itching ears. He is telling people exactly what they want to hear, and he is twisting God's word while doing so. And so if he is just saying the things that people want to hear, he is not faithfully handling God's word. He is intentionally, or maybe he's deceived. I don't know, but regardless of uh, his intentions or motivations, he is certainly twisting scripture and he is claiming that he is getting all of this from God. And we can definitively say, since it does not line up with scripture, he is not getting it from God. Because of all those things, we can say Ben Lim is someone who is to be avoided in ministry. All right, guys, I hope this is helpful to you. If it is helpful and you want to get this content out to more people, make sure you take a second now to subscribe to the channel. Also, please remember that if you would like to partner together with me financially in ministry, you can do so by checking out my profile on Ko-fi. You can make a one-time donation or you can sign up for a recurring monthly gift. Thanks so much for watching and until next time, God bless.